Um, just a little background on this site. This project's uh, funded by KISS, which is a Centre for Invasive Species Solution with DPI. And the whole idea of it um, is to try and, first of all, set up a demonstration site and try and come up with a few treatments that maybe that's going to help you manage chili and needle grass. And then the idea is we monitor this site for 12, 12 or 18 months and then that flows on to seven adaptation sites around the, the northwestern New England that it'll be simple, maybe simple treatments on farms that farmers can get involved in just to show and try and give farmers confidence about how to handle chili and needle grass. So that's sort of the basic aim of the project. Just a bit of background on chili and needle grass. It survives in 500 mils and above rainfall. Um, and you can see, I just did a bit of research. You can see why the government's a little bit worried about it, throwing a bit of money at it. Because at the moment, it's, uh, it's over 40 million hectares of land in Australia, which is about 5%. But the big issue is they've done a bit of modelling and it could up, get up to 180 million hectares, which is 23%. So think about that. Nearly a quarter of the land mass in Australia could potentially have chili and needlegrass in it somewhere. So that's a bit of a worry. Um, so it's obviously, because of that, it's on the weed of national significance. And so that the reason why we've got some money to try and do something with it, about it. Um, so I'd like to thank Kevin Tung He's kindly donated this area of land here with, a, as you can see, a nice um, infestation of chili and needle grass to uh, conduct this site. So the idea is we've put out six different herbicide treatments here, but, and then we've replicated in that block there. But what we've done with that block is we've simulated some grazing just with a mower because it's just too hard to actually get animals in here with ethics. Uh, biosecurity issues of taking animals off here where there's chili and needle grass spreading around Kevin's farm. So what we've done there, we're just going to mow that periodically like a intensive graze rest system just to see what effect down the track that might have on the chili and needle grass. So we set this site up, we did all the uh, pre-treatment pre assessments, we did some soil cores, we did a pre-vegetation assessment just to see what plants were here and uh, how much of each plant. We did some pre-density counts to get a good idea of what uh, the population of chili and needlegrass, but as you can see, it's pretty good, pretty good. So, um, and the first treatments that I put down were the pre-emergent treatments. So we're standing in, I'm standing on one here, which is flupropanate, which is tussock three litres a hectare, so you can, and we'll go through the results a bit, little bit later. You can obviously see there's a bit of difference there between that and that, and then over to round up there on my right hand side. So pre-emergent treatments applied 10th of August, which is about four months ago, this one. Uh, the post-emergent treatments, such as the glyphosate, and we did do a post-emergent of flupropanate as well, they were applied about two months ago. Uh, so I actually did, I'll just get into the results then now. If we look up at that plot there, right up on the edge, that's the, uh, the untreated block. So big difference there. And then some of these plots here, you can see the signs. This one here, uh, that's a pre-emergent treatment with tried Secura. Obviously it didn't have much effect there on the chili and needlegrass so we just tried a few treatments just to see how they'd work. But so far if you look at this one this is flupropanate three litres a hectare. As you can see that even since I've on your sheets there I did that assessment about a month ago but that's even improved since a month ago. That's we've almost got like about a 95 97 percent control here in this plot through through propanate um, as a pre-emergent three months ago. The Roundup, the glyphosate looked really good a month ago um, and there's obviously some regrowth now but there's quite a percentage of that grass that's not chili and needle grass coming back, it's other species. Um, so it's, it's so it's early sort of days, this 
Um, it's going to take some while to get some a bit more info to really nail down what treatments are best um, down the track. That uh, what I have done is have done a demonstration strip here where you're sitting. So this that was a double knock treatment. That was glyphosate, flupropanate or tussock, followed by paraquat a week later. And as you can see, there's very little chili and needle grass left in there. But it'll be really interesting to see actually what grows back in that. So that's another one we thought of a bit later. We would have liked to have put it in the uh, in the trial, but we sort of thought of it later and we thought we really need to get it out to have a look. And I'm pleased we did. Um, so, you know, on to sort of, I also did a strip of clethodum there, which from earlier work by Tony Cook, clethodum or a group A herbicide was quite effective on younger and smaller Chilean needle grass. So that might be another option as well that you could try on farm possibly. Um, so if we, with Chilean needle grass, very invasive. It's, oh, I forgot to mention, it's actually um, the most palatable of all the the nacella uh, species. It's actually have done some work on it, 12 to 70% crude protein, 58 to 66% digestibility, which is just behind fescue, which, and people regard fescue as a desirable species. Obviously, that's when it's in nice vegetative stage before it goes to seed it. Obviously, it's not gonna be very good now. Stock aren't gonna eat it. So it's going to be through your winter, early spring months before it goes to seed. So that brings me on to, you know, a tactic that might be able to help you with that is intensive grazing followed by rest periods, which will help get the biomass of the Chilean needlegrass down, give a chance for all those desirable species to get growing. Uh, as so, you know, the big component that's going to help you, I think it's only early days, but is using integrated weed management, throwing as many tactics as you can at this. Um, so obviously like double knocks one, uh, you could use things like, uh, you know, do a shallow cultivation to bring up all those seedlings, as many seedlings as you can, because we know Chilean needlegrass lives in the top 2.5 centimetres of soil. Bring all those seedlings up, as soon as they come up, hit them with a herbicide that's a really good way of trying to bring those numbers in the seed bank down. The other way through cultivation might be to do a deep burial cultivation. We know that if you get it deep enough, it hasn't got enough energy then to get up through the soil. So that's another way of, of trying to approach it. We know that chili needle grass lasts in the soil for about 12 years at Ken. So that means it's gonna be an ongoing battle You've, uh, you think you've got it eradicated, but you really need to keep monitoring, keep at it. Especially if you're lucky to only have a small incursion on your place, obviously get onto it quickly. Use things like spot spraying and only small numbers, you might be able to hand weed it. But keep going back to those areas to monitor, especially in, you can see here that's probably, uh, it's around this creek area. It's probably where it originated, maybe from hay or other livestock coming onto the place, got in the creek system, may not have even originated here, may have got upstream somewhere. And you can see there across um, between Farrah and O'Brien's Lane, there's gonna be some issues downstream from that because there's a paddock has got quite a bit of it on upstream of that. So I think this year water's gonna carry it around a lot. Um, so just keep an eye out, especially around your waterways and that sort of thing, because that's where it might come in. Obviously in drought years, it'll be through imported stock feed and that sort of thing. So uh, just a bit of a note about flupropanate. Um, obviously it's doing a pretty decent job here, um, but there is a long withholding period on this. Uh, there's four months after you spray. And then even after that period, if you have stock on there and you wanna sell them, you need to take them off that pasture where you've treated with flupropanate for at least two weeks before you send those animals to market or you milk them for human consumption. So that's it's a pretty strong chemical just to give you a bit of a warning about that. You know, once you do this sort of thing, you can't. Uh, you really need to try and bring in then some competition through 
uh, you know, establishing perennial pastures, going into, first of all, you might want to go into a three or four year period of um, a break crop, forage crop, just to try and drive those seed numbers down before you go back into perennial pastures. But try and think uh, ground cover, competition, herbicides, cultivation, or you, you really need to try and use all those tools to try and help you get on top of it. So that's probably about all I could say for the moment. Thank you. So, but if you, you know, if you haven't got it, keep a really good eye out for it. It's pretty distinctive. It's got that nice, uh, especially when it first comes out, you'll, you'll find it's got a very nice green leaf, but it's got that distinctive purple seed uh, head there. And it sort of sits, sort of weeps at like a bit of a 90 degree angle to the stem. So it's pretty distinctive. Well, obviously when it's not in seed, it's very hard to tell. So that's a little bit of the trouble with it. You're just driving around your farm. You're not going to pick it until it actually comes out in seed. So, um, you know, what, uh, being a pre-emergent, uh, we, just, we just sprayed it before the Chilean needlegrass was actually spraying. Ah, uh, sorry, growing. So, um, yeah, so in, in a normal circumstance, if I was going to apply pre-emergent to, I would try and get this as, get rid of the biomass as much as I possibly could to make sure that, that as much chemical as possible gets into that soil to, to sort of take effect. You'll find that this, some of these plots where the pre-emergence worked a bit better was there was a bit less material here when we put it out. So there is a bit of an effect there. Yeah, so... So Mark asked, the, yeah, whether, what stage the Chilean needlegrass? It was in, in winter, so Chilean needlegrass was short and green, only, you know, a few inches high at that stage. So, uh, whether the grasses will come back and compete against uh, Chilean needlegrass here later on, and, it's, and I don't really know at this stage, so hopefully through observation um, we'll, we're going to find out. But I'm expecting it, yeah, definitely to to uh, stay a bit bare or stop it for a while yet, just from anecdotal sort of stuff that I've heard, but that's just gonna be a wait and see, just how much comes back through that. So, uh, had a bit of an issue here, there's a lot of plains, there's some plains grass through here as well, so it's really hard to pick. I was trying to do a count uh, on here and it was, yeah, it was just impossible to pick between plains grass or any winter C3 natives that are still green through winter, so. The question was, can we use spray graze as a management tool? Um, that's something we could certainly could look at. Yeah, we haven't looked at it yet, but that might be down the track in another experiment for sure. Yep. Uh, also, possibly spray topping as well, try and sterilise that seed. Yeah, uh, the question was, could we combine Group A herbicides together to try um, to see if we can have an effect? Um, that's certainly something we can try. We haven't tried yet, but we're open to suggestions on down the track on what we can try and you know if anyone uh, has got any something that they've tried on their farm that's worked really well we'd love to know because we're really open to ideas of what we can try. So the question was the wet season has that helped the flupropionate work and is it wiping out other perennial grasses? Not. I think the wet season definitely help it work but I'm not sure what effect it's going to have on those other perennial grasses just yet hopefully down the track. So that'll be a really in interesting observation of time with Lester's too, is what grasses we're gonna see come back through these plots. Um, so obviously if you're, if you're doing this at home somewhere, you know, down the track, you're obviously not gonna leave this like this. You're gonna have a plan of going into a crop, uh, trying to spread some seed out, try and get a perennial pasture going after this, because obviously if you leave it, once the flupropanate wears off, Chilean needlegrass is just going to come back through all this bare ground again where there's no competition. So. What about fire? Did you have fire protection? Yeah, I did uh, actually reading about that. Um, fire actually promotes it, so actually get, makes it even more of a monoculture. But if you do use fire, they say to rest it afterwards, don't graze it, so you give the chance for some of the other plants to get up and going. But if you if you do going to use fire, say to get rid of the biomass, you would like to have another tool coming in after the fire once it regrows. So a herbicide, cultivation, whatever, then go back into it, try and go into a pasture phase or a break crop, try and break it up. The comment was from Lester that 
uh, with cooler tie grass, similar sort of situation, try to control it. Got a control on the cooler try grass, but if left alone and, and nothing uh, put back in there, well, the cooler tie grass just came back, which is going to be the same thing for the Chilean needle grass. So if I understand the question, um, if we plant tropical grasses, we'll get rid of, um, we'll have the competition for um, Chilean needle grass? Yeah. Good. Um, the main competition we can apply is through the summer period. So Chilean needle grass is just cr climbing around the ground on during winter. So if we've got some competition there, when it starts to get going, then that should be in its favour of, um, of the tropical grass. But again, you want a nice dense tropical grass. Lester. Uh, the question was, maybe we could use glyphosate on the tropical grass in the winter time, try and that'll, uh, the idea being the tropical grass obviously dormant, shut down. Chilean needle grass is small and growing, so that's definitely an option. Just a little bit of caution there. Uh, I actually tried that at home on my place. Um, if you get the rate wrong, you can, you know, damage your trop uh, some of your grasses a little bit. So just be very careful with the rate and that sort of thing. That's something that needs a bit more experimentation. Uh, the question was, because this uh, plant's got three different ways of mechanisms of setting seed, um, and there's guys up at Gyra now that are using spray top to try and sterilise that seed. Uh, the question is, if they're using sub-lethal dose of, uh, doses of glyphosate, which you need for, for spray topping, um, how long before we're going to get resistance to Roundup? Um, I know, being a Group M, it uh, takes about 20 or so hits of Roundup before you actually uh, get, you know, start to get resistant populations coming through. So that's going to be very much dependent on that particular place and whatever, but it certainly could be an issue down the track, that's for sure. Yep.